I am the uh, moderator for this session. It's number 55, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on uh, Court Internet Values. Uh, dynamic coalitions were initiated by the IGF uh, in the beginning, pretty much in the beginning of its existence. The idea of uh, special interest groups, of course, uh, occurs in many organizations. Uh, here they were called dynamic coalitions, and there were a number of them set up uh, to uh, address various topics. The um, uh, Dynamic Coalition on Internet Values uh, has been spearheaded by Alejandro Pisanti, uh, who is uh, rem joining us remotely from Mexico City. Uh, and it uh, has a number of, uh, uh, of members and also a website uh, in which uh, its activities are tracked. Uh, the purpose of uh, this workshop is to uh, talk about core internet values and in particular uh, to look at um, policy changes in the internet space in the recent past and what they have done um, with respect to either enhancing or detracting from core internet values. Now, uh, I'm not a member of the coalition, so when I was asked to do this, uh, uh, this task, uh, I th started thinking, uh, what are core internet values to start with? It turns out that the coalition uh, has a fairly well-defined way of looking at this, uh, uh, but uh, yes. All right, we have a second microphone. Uh, uh, I thought, well, the internet itself, the internet's a network, uh, and uh, as such, it really has no values as a network. Uh, the values are what can be done with it. But then I thought, well, the people who built the internet in the early 19, late 69, 1970, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, they had a sense of what the internet could do. Uh, part, hold just a moment. Uh, we have a problem with people who are participating remotely. Could they hear me with the first microphone I had? Oh, that's not good. Um, all right, well, it seems, do we have an option? I don't know. Can they see the text, Ian asks, remotely? I can see the text. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, let's see, where was I? The, the people who uh, uh, conceived of the Internet and designed it clearly did have values, which they felt that existing, um, that existing uh, networks were, uh, in particular the PSTN, the public uh, switch telephone network, uh, were not providing. And uh, those basic values affected the, um, the architecture of the network of the internet, of the TCP IP protocol family, uh, and established a culture uh, of the internet which early on was uh, focused on research and education and the values, the human values that went with research and education uh, were ones of collaboration and sharing, uh, in fact, very aggressive sharing of information at that time. And uh, that's the internet culture which still exists uh, but has uh, clearly has made accommodation for other kinds of, uh, of uses of the internet. Now, by embodying po potential in the um, implementation of the internet, uh, the internet now supports the kinds of, uh, of things that, uh, uh, that help us to, uh, to exercise our human values. So for example, uh, uh, the internet has uh, uh, no central point of control. Uh, that is extraordinarily helpful for issues such as privacy, everyone and everyone a publisher. Uh, the, uh, and the kinds of functionality that the architecture allows then allows us to make use of the internet for, uh, for our human values uh, freedom of expression, et cetera, that are based ultimately on that first set of choices for implementation of the net. The coalition has chosen three particular uh, values which are what they consider to be the core internet values, uh, and they are, they are on the screen now. If you can see the screen, uh, this is uh, more than just those three, but it's a list of what we think has happened to those uh, values by virtue of uh, various activities in the last year. But the uh, values chosen are end-to-end -end connectivity, interoperability, and openness. And so what we'll be doing uh, is first having Alejandro Pisanti uh, walk us through uh, what, his work and what he has done and why he has done it. 
Uh, and then we'll have our commentators uh, on the panel talk about sp the specific issues in this space. Uh, then we'll have them argue with each other because they're I hope they're not likely to agree on everything. And then we'll open it up for audience participation. So Alessandro Pisanti, who is the uh, professor at the uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico and who is online, will now uh, take over. Can you put Alejandro on? Alejandro, we are we're waiting for you to speak. Uh, it may be that the link is not working. I think that hypothesis is being confirmed. Okay, any any uh, technical moderator? Do you have anything to say? Uh, probability of uh, reestablishing the link. Uh, in order to uh, make good use of time, uh, while uh, the technical staff is trying to reestablish the link with Alejandro, uh, we'll go to our panelists. And uh, what I'm going to do is to tell you their names, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in terms of background, but limit the introduction to 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and then, uh, in, in the spirit of tweeting uh, verbally, and uh, uh, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists to make whatever comments they wish on this space, uh, five minutes or so, plus or minus. Uh, and let's uh, let's go through the panel. And uh, I'll ask the technical moderator to signal me when we have Alejandro back online. Okay, Jeremy. Thank you very much. I'm Jeremy Malcolm. I work as Senior Project Officer for Consumers International, which is the Global Federation of Consumer Groups. I think that's my 140 characters. Uh, and uh, do I make remar my remarks now or pass on to the next? No. Uh, okay. So um, I, of course, um, uh, agree with all of the core internet principles uh, so far as they go. Uh, I was in a panel yesterday organized by the OECD um, and ISOC on the value of openness. Uh, and so I went into that session and I said, well, it's difficult to know what to, uh, how to approach this panel because there's nothing really to disagree with. So I decided to um, say how much I hate openness just to make it a bit more interesting. So I'm going to do the same thing today and I'm going to say, I'm going to try and gently critique the idea that advancing the core values of the internet um, uh, is uh, an end in itself and particularly the underlying assumption that these core values have a necessary relationship with broader social values such as human rights. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I, the approach of uh, nominating these core internet values uh, seems to imbue them with some sort of transcend, trans, uh, transcendent moral value of their own, whereas in fact they're basically technical choices that the engineers made in the beginning which don't in themselves have any legitimacy that we can convincingly justify. Because these were just a bunch of engineers. I mean, we, we admire them. Um, they were brilliant. They had good, uh, you know, no doubt they had a good uh, moral sense. But, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't, uh, they were just human beings. And they, they didn't have necessarily the broad exposure to all of the social conditions that now apply to internet users around the world. Um, so often our support for these values just comes down to unspoken sentiments like uh, we like hacker culture because the technical choices that the hackers made back then tended to support policies that we favour such as freedom of expression and so on. But it was a fairly narrow culture, you know, it was mainly people from the West, it was mainly people, um, educated white men. Um, and so why should anyone from outside that culture, that subculture, um, agree with the decisions that they made? 
it's not justifiable as the outcome of any democratic, still less globally democratic process. You know, these engineers, they were good people, but they weren't elected, you know. They weren't inclusi an inclusive group in terms of uh, geography or, or, uh, or gender balance and so on. So mostly the choices that they did make are favourable for our underlying values, such as freedom of expression um, and, and less often privacy. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes they don't favour those underlying values. Sometimes they're a, you know, they're a real pain. How, for example, these values facilitate spam and um, other antisocial things that the technical community, as much as anyone, has subsequently had to fight against. Um, so governments, when, we, we, when the internet uh, technical community is talking to governments and saying, look, we know what to do, the governments have some justification in saying, well, why? Why are you elevating these key characteristics to such a privileged position when maybe if different technical choices had been made in the beginning, we might have had a slightly different set of core values of the internet and those might not have caused some of the same problems like spam and cybercrime and, and so on. So my conclusion is I want to suggest, and I'm deliberately being a little bit provocative here, but I want to suggest that we don't want to reify these core values of the internet so much. For advancing particular policies, these values may be good, um, or they may be bad, or they may be indifferent, but they certainly weren't handed down to us by God, and, and governments have no reason to treat them as such. So um, just a little bit of food for thought to begin. Thank you, Jeremy. Next, Suzanne Wolf. <laughs> Your tweet, please. Oh, my, my tweet. Yeah, what I have here is 20 years' experience as a policy friendly internet technologist, white, not a man. <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, there's not much I can do about being either white or not a man. Um, I'm, I, I, I was sitting here listening. Um, I'm actually really happy with, it, with what Jeremy said because I was sort of heading for being a little bit provocative in the other direction, which is to say, um, first of all, as, as, not, as a, uh, not familiar with the Dynamic Coalition, I had the opportunity to come in very, very much fresh, not, not exposed previously to this picture of what the core values were. Um, and from my experience, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking only for myself, but I have worked in the field, you know, I've worked in the policy bodies for ICANN and for the RIRs. Um, I've been a working technologist. And from that perspective, these values actually make a great deal of sense to me. Not because they're always the friendliest to a particular set of social policies or social priorities, but because overall they seem like the best way to maximize the chance of evolving the infrastructure as the social needs change. Um, my alternate view, in fact, of the, the, the underlying core values in the sense that we're talking about them here, um, I would almost reduce to two, that the infrastructure must be flexible, which is close to what we've been talking about as interoperability, but goes even further as a general principle that we need to be able to keep the infrastructure friendly to whatever we need to build on top of it, even things we can't foresee yet. And the other fundamental value is scalability, which I think subsumes what we're talking about here as, as openness as well, where the other, the other thing we have to preserve is that whatever we're doing with the infrastructure that enables people, you know, more users to do more good and useful things, that, that continue to work as we have billions more users. And millions more applications and trillions more bits. And what I would argue, again, to be just, a, a, you know, to happily be a little bit provocative, is that we actually have some examples, um, not only privacy, um, but, you know, the, the, the easy one to pick on in this, in this context right now is the surveillance concerns where these are extremely important concerns, there are extremely important social principles involved, but there's also a caution that there's always a temptation to modify these underlying core principles to 
deal with a particular challenge, a particular issue, a particular set of concerns. We've been there before. There will be other challenges in the future. And even as serious as today's challenges are, we have to proceed with the assumption that there will be other challenges in the future, and we don't want to compromise our ability to deal with those in order to deal with today's. So I'm kind of staking out the opposite territory there, but um, I, I, I think that really is a, a discussion worth having, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here for it. Thank you very much. Um, do we have progress on the technical linkage? No. Probably not yet. Okay. The, right. Can he speak? Can he speak now? Okay, uh, then uh, I'm going to interrupt here, the flow I and uh, introduce uh, Alejandro Pisanti. Uh, you only get noises from the room. Can you understand me? Uh, we just need more volume. We, 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 we hear you at uh, a low level of volume. We'll try to, uh, to increase that. Can we? Alex, talk loudly. Let's try it. I will talk loud. Let's see if it works. I it's will do this very briefly. Uh, I agree with uh, Suzanne particularly. Uh, what, uh, that is exactly what we started, uh, what the reason we started this dynamic coalition. We see that there are rights uh, issues like privacy. Other people are more concerned about child protection and other uh, kinds of conduct. And each of them can lead to some apparently small adjustment of the way the network operates, where you would want to change it to make it better. But you may suddenly not have the internet. Uh, so our concern is to monitor how these basic issues with the internet, like uh, openness of the network, interoperability, uh, scalability, as Susan has said, a few others. Uh, are being affected or in risk of being affected, whether negatively or uh, in, in a chance of being improved uh, by other things that are happening. Uh, to, be, to make this very brief, that's why we decided this year to look at a couple of these values, end to end, uh, and more, uh, let me say first, more than speaking of values, we are always speaking of the design principles. And we only speak of values insofar as the design principles also translate into values. Uh, but the core is uh, the core concern is on the principles that make the internet be the internet. This uh, all-encompassing communications medium that we just throughout the world. So, for this year, we chose to analyze what has been the effect of on the end, to, uh, let's say, improvements or challenges on end-to-end, -end, on openness, and uh, as you can see in the table, uh, you can, uh, uh, we, we, we went to this, to this value for, with a poll that was sent out to a number of experts, and uh, that was a small provoca provocative conversation, so it seems that everybody is being provocative today. Uh, that was a uh, bouncing around for a few weeks. We got some very interesting replies from people who are very knowledgeable about this from very different angles, not only the technical one. And we got, uh, you, 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 you have the summary uh, in the room. Uh, what uh, we see are some of the um, opinions that, and the evaluations that we get on improvements, challenges, or things that are either neutral or unclear. Just to mention one, and to come back to what Susan has mentioned, which is a surveillance issue. Uh, on one hand, the openness on the internet uh, seems to have uh, suffered a challenge uh, with the revelations about the extensive surveillance in many countries, uh, because there is a chilling effect, and users are reviewing uh, what technologies they will use. They will probably use technologies that are less open like encryption, uh, which will not always be an open uh, standard encryption. So that will make openness suffer. On the other hand, the sole fact that we know 
so much more publicly about the extensive surveillance that has been taking place, that many more people are aware of this, and there is pressure on the technical and the commercial and the political levels uh, to deal with this surveillance, that is actually going to be beneficial for openness and also for interoperability and for the end-to-end -end principle, because people are actually going to make sure that they have these principles uh, apply in better protected uh, communications and with a better threat model. I will close for now just commenting on one point that Jeremy said, which is indeed that we are, uh, we are not casting anything in stone, but we certainly, as Susan has said, have identified principles that guide especially the technical community in their operations, planning, standardization, and the invention of new technologies. And uh, certainly the only thing that we would uh, not resign uh, to is uh, the permanent beta principle, the open innovation, the permissionless innovation that derives from these principles. The end-to-end -end principle is being changed as we speak, in, in interpreted and rebuilt, uh, so goes for the other ones. But uh, the main point is that they keep the internet open to all, open to all innovations, and uh, that they continue to be, as George emphasized, decentralized, so you don't have a central point of control to ask where you can build your own private new internet uh, that, uh, that may, may distort what we really have as global reach. Thank you. Alex, thank you very much. Uh, don't go away because there will be questions and discussion uh, for you after the, uh, the speakers give their first impressions. Uh, next, we have Carol Rossini. Your tweet, please, and your views. Um, hi, and thank you for the invitation to join the table. Um, my name is Carolina Rossini, and I am a Brazilian uh, lawyer, and currently I live in the U.S. directing the Latin America program within the New America Foundation. I work in these issues like for 12 years, and by U.S. law, I am a known person, <laughs> which means I can be surveilled without any warrant, um, even living in U.S. So I actually want to react to some points, but one of my focus, I would like to go a little vertical and talk a little bit about one option done by the W3C that actually is against the core values that they have been advocating for so many years, right? I want to talk a little bit about uh, the EMN, right? The encrypted media extension, which is a DRM, uh, which is a technology that allows DRM in the core uh, technology uh, of the internet. Um, so in terms of some of the reactions, I am really worried uh, with one word, Susan, you use it actually, that's the word friendly. Uh, as a lawyer, right, we look at these words and they do have many meanings and uh, I do think that we are in a moment that we really have to advocate for the implementation of the core principles as they mean, and friendly, for example, means choices, right? But also means choices for the good and for the bad. So should we be developing just good choices on what open actually means? So I do think we have to be very careful with some words that open for bad design under what we imagine, right? So just, it's just a quick note on that because I'm really concerned now, as you know, Brazil, uh, besides of all the surveillance issues that we have been discussing now, we are implementing one of the first laws to regulate the internet, which is the Marco Civil, and we are in a very difficult moment to carefully uh, 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 regulate what these principles means, right? And what net neutrality means, and what neutrality means in practice, right? So uh, I actually would love help from this community that's concerned with the core principles to help on that drafting. Uh, hopefully the Marco Civil is gonna uh, be approved within this year, uh, so we're gonna then pass to the regulation stage. But let's go and move forward to the DRM, right? So as many of you may know, uh, Tim Berners-Lee announced that the working group uh, on uh, one of the working groups of the W3C will incorporate what they call playback of protected content. Um, and this does mean that this working group may have in its uh, work products 
uh, technology that enables DRM to be embedded on our browsers and many of the technologies that we use on the day by day, right? Many organizations protested. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee visited Brazil in the beginning of the, in the beginning of this year, and we had a, a mass protest there during his visit. But however, that was approved in, in October, and that does. I do believe that is a dangerous step for an organization that's seen by many as the guardian of the open web. And that's when I come back to Jeremy, right? We trust this organization many times should take decisions for us, but should we keep trusting or should we have more accountability issues regarding what, what the W3C does, right? So I think it's a question here of representativeness of what all these core uh, issues means and accepting them and I could let to various stakeholders, various rights holders actually, right, the big content companies, the big Hollywood companies, demand the same privilege, right, uh, in terms of uh, 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 our images and pages cannot be saved or searched, ads cannot be blocked, and innovative new browsers cannot compete without explicit permission from the big content companies. And this really worries me if you cross what's going on at the technical level with the content layer, right? At the content layer, we are negotiating in multilateral forums like the organization, uh, the, um, the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, a series of exceptions and limitations, treaties for the blind, for libraries, for education, and those, they say these communities can have access to content, can copy content. There is a lot of exceptions. And how much DRM get entrenched in the technology, harder and harder will be the exercise of those rights at the content layer. So this worries me a lot, right? We are again compromising uh, towards something that's practical, pr practical, uh, a practical decision against something that we should uh, 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 take has a core value. Um, so I won't go much further because another colleague will also discuss this issue, but I do think uh, we have a problem moving forward with the HTML5 discussion. And again, I pose, uh, I pose this question for you in the audience and for us in the panel, should practic practicability overread core values over and over again? That's not the first time it happened. This is a suboptimal solution without considering the implication for other major stakeholders. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I should warn you that uh, Carol is the first of three intellectual property lawyers to talk, and so this question is probably going to get beaten to death by the time we're done. Um, so the next uh, speaker is Hong Shui. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Joe. My name is Xue uh, Hong. I'm a law professor from Beijing Normal University, director of the Institute for Internet Policy and Law, also the co-director of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and the Beijing Normal University Joint Certificate Program. Um, well, yesterday, I um, had a short discussion with George and Suzanne. It was very helpful. We tried to set up a framework to understand this uh, very comprehensive document kindly presented by Alejandro. Uh, yeah, we, we try to highlight that there's a technical value that's been designed into the internet configurations, as Suzanne has very beautifully and gracefully presented, so I no supplement. And there are the social values we want to promote, and these values may or may not be consistent with these core value uh, that's been enshrined in the technological configuration of the internet, such as privacy. It is not working very well with the internet, very open, flexible uh, structure, but it's a value we need to promote uh, in the society with the development of the uh, uh, internet. Uh, well, as our colleague has mentioned, the DRM, I can't agree with more. Since the World Internet Property Organization introduced the legal protection for technological measures for copyright protection in 1996, but these um, uh, uh, digital right management well, has been uh, very much uh, uh, developed and expanded, uh, widely implemented. Uh, of course, copyright owner is not required to implement any technological measures to protect the copyright work, but as far as it takes the measure to protect the works, the, these measures must be protected by the law. And what we can see uh, uh, now is that 
It has been built into the free trade agreement is, and this uh, pl plurilateral trade agreement like TPPs uh, and, and is very much uh, uh, more than the original legal protection design at the WIPO, WCT and WPPT. This is pretty dangerous, but since we're not talking about the legal issue, I'll go back to the technical issue and its relevance to the coal value. I've used one specific uh, uh, example, as my colleague mentioned, the WCT's uh, new standards. I want to mention the domain name takedown measure. I think this is very dangerous. Uh, new uh, technological measure is used as a law enforcement. Um, previously, there's a couple of uh, law enforcement measure uh, on the internet, but they're primarily at application or content level. Uh, we know the famous notice to take down a measure that's uh, introduced by uh, the MCH from 1998. But now it seems this takedown is going down into the critical internet resource level. Uh, the, the copyright industry discovered a shortcut to through takedown a domain name. Of course, it seems you permanently and uh, quickly take down the contents uh, that's contained in the website. But this is really many, many problems. And this actually directly go against the core value of end-to-end. -end. Well, think about a domain name registry and registrar. They don't distinguish the infringing traffic, or so-called, or the non-infringing traffic. How can they differentiate which content, which piece of information, which packet is infringing the other's copyright? Uh, this is uh, really against uh, all the technical design value uh, that's always been respected in the internet community. Of course, the, the lawyers may be applauding for the uh, swiftness of this enforcement, but think about the legitimacy of this measure. I know there has been two bills submitted to U.S. Congress, but it was not really worked out, but people are still working on that. I do call you uh, concern, I do call your attention to this new initiative that is really not consistent with internet core value and we should think about how uh, and to what extent this law enforcement measure should be uh, consistent with the core value of internet, right? If it's going to be implemented in internet. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker, uh, Alice Munya. Uh, thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, a lot has been said, so I'm going to be very brief. My name is Alice Munya. I'm a Kenyan working with the African Union Commission. Um, from a policy maker perspective, and from somebody who lives and works in Africa, um, you know, there's a general agreement that really principles do play a very fundamental role, especially in regulatory, in ICT regulatory regimes and, 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 and policy uh, processes and, and, and implementation, especially of regulation. Uh, but from where I'm sitting at uh, the African Union Commission, we tend to think that most of them actually suffer from ambiguity uh, and also contradiction. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, I personally tend to think they just serve as rhetoric for some, for various stakeholder groups. But really, you know, uh, when you come down to really defining them, uh, uh, defining them in a way that, that, that makes sense, in a way that can be implemented, uh, becomes a little difficult. Um, and also um, just simply balancing the needs and concerns of the, uh, of, of the different constituencies also becomes a problem. And for example, you know, our government uh, or, or the African Union has a, a very specific concern, cybersecurity, and we saw it played, played out uh, during the wicket. So the, I think the issue here is balancing, you know, uh, uh, balancing that, balancing the need to have uh, principles and norms uh, the need uh, to, to have uh, legislation or a, a, a regulatory framework that addresses issues of spam, cybersecurity, data protection versus uh, the issue of uh, free uh, flow of, in, of information uh, and privacy. So most policymakers will be attempting to define rules and regulations before really, you know, before uh, thinking about uh, uh, principles and, and, and norms. Uh, that, that, you know, as a reaction to what they believe, because most of them would believe, and also th they believe that most of us are on the internet, and really we are not, and so that we need protection. So there is also, you know, that issue, the lack of looking at, uh, at perhaps access uh, practically before uh, implementing uh, uh, regulation uh, and, 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 uh, and norms. 
Um, you know, so and, uh, th then one, for me, one principle that is very important, and I see it played out in uh, a lot of internet governance uh, spaces, including ICANN, is the issue of diversity and participation. Uh, when I look around the room, I think I'm the only one from the African continent, and this is, the, you know, th this is a problem in, in that, uh, you know, we keep talking about diversity, but how do you practically implement it? How do you ensure, you know, so we all have to have to come all the way back to ensuring that we have enough of us having access to the internet to be able to actually, uh, you know, have impact on some of these processes, or or uh, or are we going to spend a lot of money and resources trying to bring? you know, many of us to these spaces, but there's no really meaningful uh, participation because it's not yet, you know, uh, we, you know, for us accessing the internet, it's still not a real life livelihood issue. It is uh, from a policy perspective and from a development perspective. Uh, but I think if you ask, you know, um, you know amongst the needs, it's, it's really still not uh, as important. Uh, so I think those are the challenges, uh, you know, uh, and, yeah, the challenges of, you know, um, ensuring that as many of us from the developing countries, you know, are able to participate and meaningfully, you know, meaningfully, and diversity, uh, not just linguistic and cultural, but diversity in, 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 in literally pl playing a role uh, in, in uh, uh, determining how the, 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 the internet is, is governed. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of round one. Um, so uh, uh, there have been a number of provocative things said. I have a number of questions. I suspect others do too. Um, who would like to uh, challenge uh, what's been said or add to what has been said, uh, complement what's been said by another speaker? Anyone on the panel? OK. Uh, well, yeah, we could. I guess we will. Uh, fine. Let's see what the uh, what participants in the room uh, have to say about uh, anything that's been presented or any other aspect of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, core principles that have been uh, espoused here. Okay, I see uh, Ian, then the woman in front of Ian, and the man in the back. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, this. Oh, could you give, uh, state your name and affiliation? Sure. That would help. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Hu Xianhong from uh, UNESCO. It's a great pleasure to hear all your excellent, uh, interesting presentation. And um, uh, first of all, I want to share many of your views without being provocative. Uh, you know that uh, UNESCO is a uh, intergovernmental organization from our point of view that uh, we see intergovern internet governance should be governed by sort of international uh, agreed standards and uh, principles based on the universal declaration of human rights which has been endorsed by all the member states of the united nations in 1948 and uh, in the context of uh, internet governance, uh, we also perceive there are several other integral principles and core values should be equally preserved. Uh, as you have also mentioned, uh, openness, for example. We, when we see openness, we see not only the technical standard, but also market, uh, business, renovation, openness. And uh, uh, also the core values such as accessibility, including the multilingualism, uh, content diversity, and also capacity of the user's literacy. Uh, well, uh, on top of all of this, the multi-stakeholderism is definitely a core value. Every uh, session is talking about it. My question is that, uh, well, I personally definitely think that uh, these uh, core values, human rights-based openness, accessibility, and artistic tourism, uh, should be respected by all stakeholders. And But what do you think about the role, particularly of the role of uh, technical community, and maybe also some internet um, intermediaries? Do you think, what do you think about their role? Do they, should they have a uh, same responsibility to respect uh, those human rights standards. For example, if I am an engineer, imagine 
I was writing the code, I was doing, or I'm developing a standard. Shall I think about uh, what does it mean to the human rights, for example, privacy or free expression? Does it kind of imply anything? Shall I uh, try to respect it from the level of technical? Uh, at the beginning, we start to do this technical choice. Just like when we advise our member states, governments, when you do their policy advice, please high respect those uh, uh, standards. And also, is there any good practice or bad one? Uh, if you'd like to share, I'd like to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, you've given me a wonderful segue into the next workshop that I'm uh, chairing, uh, which is Friday morning. There's a, a workshop on, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's this afternoon uh, at 2.30, the role of the technical community in internet governance. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, number 210, uh, we'll, we'll explore that further. But who on the panel would like to uh, talk to this? Carol? I, I just want to uh, address uh, one of the points. Um, two points, actually. I do think the core values are broad enough. It's very interesting, right, when we think about principles, right? Even in Brazil, when Juma talked about spoke in UM, she used five principles, but th those do open in the 10 principles that we have in CGE Brazil. And here I think is the same. We have four principles, so it's end-to-end, uh, -end, openness, interoperability, and uh, freedom of expression is actually part of the dynamic coalition of core principles. And I do think some of the principles you mentioned are within diversity, for example, has per the definition of this coalition, the work of this coalition that we are are all kind of new to uh, is within openness. Um, so that's, maybe that's a didactic division. We can agree or disagree. Maybe we have more, we need more time to discuss that. The other point I would like to address is the ICP issue. I completely agree with you, but I do think that ISPs sometimes are put in very, very difficult situations, right? We can complain about Google, about Twitter, uh, Facebook, we can actually complain. <laughs> but, uh, for example, Google and Twitter, at least in Brazil, and also, as I know a little bit in the US, they do fight back in many court orders uh, regarding takedown and user uh, identity, right? They request for identity. At least in the US, they do have uh, processes to do that by, the, by law, by the DMCA for example, and also the, the, the data pr uh, personal. In Brazil, we are still fighting for that, right? We hope that with the Marco Civil and the uh, data protection law, which many people forget, but we are actually discussing three very important laws in Brazil, data protection, Marco Civil, and copyright law reform. All those will impact on what we are seeing here. Uh, so we need to fight for those issues, and I do believe that sometimes they are put into corners, right? Uh, uh, and U.S. with the surveillance uh, legislation, uh, they do press a lot ISPs to not uh, to review everything they have, otherwise they can have their door shut down. So, uh, well, that's a little exaggerated, but that's that's one of the risks, right? So, I agree with you, but at the same time, I think we also need to pressure the government to go do to do good policies, so technicians and the technical community and the expert community can act can actually exercise their ideals, right, which is very strong in the technical community. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to go off, uh, this is Suzanne, I'm actually going to go off a little bit on a tangent inspired by what you said, though. I'm hearing two different uses of the word core, and there's a certain tension between them that I'm, I'm, I think is interesting, because core can mean, you know, the most important, the most fundamental parts of what we're trying to do. And those are those are, are largely social values and, and requirements, but also core can be the central part, the part that everything else is built on. And I think one of the things that's interesting here is that as a technologist who's worked within the core of the internet in the technical sense, I hear this as an issue. That we're, we're talking largely about the values that go into that all of the technology and all of the implementation of policy and social values is built on, and that there's actually a distinction to be made that I think it's, it's important to make when we're talking about policy between asking technologists to help implement certain policies and values, but also preserving the, the technological core, the thing, the thing that makes it possible to build new things, 
because we can, it's easy and tempting to build particular social values and policies in, in a way that limits our ability to implement others later or, or differently or when different constituents and different stakeholders need different things from the infrastructure. And, and I think that distinction is actually important to, to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Thanks, George. Um, Ian, Peter. Um, what I've got to say flows on very well from what Suzanne just said, I think. Um, uh, Alex, please, Ian, thank you. Um, I was involved with the first meeting of this coalition, which was in um, Sharm el Sheikh, and I'd, I'd like to particularly pay credit to the work that Siva Sabranian did in bringing this together, and indeed probably in keeping us together. Um, when we first met, it was very much about having an open exchange of ideas on this, and you know, there was um, this distinction that you make now, which I think is an important one, wasn't there. Now, I, I do think keeping clear these core technical values which enable other things is important, but I do think also it's very important that we consider things which are not necessarily entirely technical, but which are core values. So, for instance, the non-proprietary uh, nature of the backbone is not necessarily technical, it flows from it, but I think is extremely important. Um, universal availability is not a technical decision, but it flows from the, the nature of the platform. Um, uh, and you know, things like the free flow of information definitely have political ramifications. I think they're core values, but then again, they're not necessarily technical values. So I certainly would hope as we go forward, we encompass both. Um, and you know, sort of defining this interrelationship, I think, is good. But let's not forget this stuff that flows from it. So thank you. I'm interested in that. I'd like to offer a short comment on that. Uh, the, uh, uh, I understand what you say, and I'm sympathetic to it. Uh, however, there is, uh, and there's no reason why both can't be considered, but I think sometimes what happens is that they conflate, that the, the issue of values is talked about at the level of the core technical values. Pardon me? Am I hearing my own echo? Oh, oh, oh thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, and. Uh, it's true that the core technical values at the technical level influence the implementation, influence what we can do with the network, influence how we can use it to, uh, to extend the values that we, be we believe, such as freedom no, of expression, et cetera. The, the, the problem, of course, is that it's much easier to agree on these three technical values, although Jeremy did raise a point, they didn't fall from the sky. Uh, and it's a lot harder to, uh, to unpack uh, at a detailed level the, the values that are human values uh, as you suggest. Uh, Alex? Can we get Alex? Yes, here I am. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yes, so here I am. And uh, George, um, I think that you and uh, Susan have got it uh, particularly clear. Um, the, the idea of this coalition is that there are a number of efforts to define uh, principles for the governance of the internet in the higher layers. We have the dynamic coalition for network neutrality, which is starting its work in this IGF. You have the very good work of the um, Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition, which is doing fantastic work. There are many others. Uh, but uh, as you can see in each of them, there are uh, different values for those values, so to speak. There are different conclusions. Uh, as Carolina explains, for example, the Marco Civil, the civil framework uh, in Brazil has a number of uh, governance principles. Uh, they are very similar, but not quite the same as some of the subsets the IRP has looked at. Wolfgang Kleinwächter and others are making collections and collages of sets of principles at a national, regional, and global level, and we have to keep the technical infrastructure as much as possible agnostic uh, and advanced before those conclusions are reached. So, for example, if in a region uh, hate speech is a major concern uh, and it is agreed that the governance principle will be to curtail 
or stop the transmission of hate speech, you will be erecting national boundaries and asking for a very strong intervention in the flow of packets through deep packet inspection, uh, which may actually be violating the end-to-end -end principle, whereas there are technical principles for blocking and filtering, which are now in their fourth edition being discussed in the IETF, and they are well known outside. So the idea for this coalition's work is to enter in dialogue, not in opposition, uh, but to make sure that when uh, we hear people in the coalition or in the organizations that we can communicate with, hear that there's a proposal that will enshrine forever the human right for, uh, let's say, the right to be forgotten, which has been a very vivid discussion in the last few years. Uh, someone has technically remind the people who come to this idea that it may not be possible to implement it without actually breaking uh, something fundamental in the and thus foster the dialogue between these technical and uh, less technical communities. Uh, at the same time, many people in this dynamic coalition and in the, dyna in the, in the technical organizations like Susan Fakwell also work in uh, other related fields, more social or legal. And uh, again, this is a very good way to, to build those bridges. It's uh, inclusive in this sense. It's not trying to fight with anybody. It's trying to enter in a dialogue that is more and more necessary as more uh, civil organizations, people in uh, developing countries, and uh, governments come onto the network, to try onto the internet, to try to develop their own agendas. And we may have to make sure that once you decide how you want to govern, mm -hmm. you still have an internet. Thank you, Alex. Um, there are two gentlemen in the back with questions. I think the person on my left has priority here. No, 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 this guy. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I saw him first, really. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan McGarry. I work with the Pacific Institute of Public Policy. We're um, an independent think tank operating in the Pacific Islands region. And uh, I, I, I want to reinforce a couple of things that I, that I've heard um, and then come back to uh, a sort of a, a more general point. Um, my background, by the way, I, I have worked in internet for about as long as the web has been around, so not forever, but for a fair amount of time, and uh, done so in communities um, from Baffin Island in the Canadian Arctic out to the South Pacific, and so small coal face kind of stuff is, is w most of my experience. Um, I think, I, 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 I'll, I'll confess to a lot of trepidation here um, when we talk about the core principles and we don't have, for example, the telcos in the room because, you know, at the, forgive me, but I'll bring some real politic into the, into the conversation here. Um, we can say what we like, uh, but at the end of the day, it's not the legislation, it's the regulation, really, that's going to define a great deal of what happens, that is, the commercial activity. Um, the principles of internet are expressed at a, a logical level, if you will, um, TCP IP and uh, related protocols. The practicalities of the internet are dictated at the physical level, at the infrastructure level, and every time we've seen severe abrogations of the basic principles that we have here, core human rights, they tend to be a result of the physical network topology. And so unless we, we have some way, politically, of addressing that, all the talk in the world isn't going to save us. Now, the, the second point I wanted to make was um, something that, uh, that that's very close to my heart, um, and that is the diversity that we've uh, that we've heard addressed uh, by the uh, by the panel members already. Um, living as I do in a microcosmically small part of the world uh, that we call it the blue continent, um, with unique cultures, Vanuatu, the country where I live, has over a hundred languages. Papua New Guinea has over a thousand languages. Um, Solomon Islands has several hundred languages, and these are just in my neighborhood. Um, the 
danger of prescriptive approaches, especially to the expression of moral and social standards, um, is, I think, a very dangerous road. And uh, Dr. Pisanti has, has already uh, talked about this as well. Um, I think it actually goes beyond taking a minimalist approach, even a sort of a UN kind of, you know, Declaration of Human Rights approach, which attempts to find common ground among people. I think even that pushes and marginalizes uh, certain communities. And uh, so I, I don't, unfortunately, have any really good prescriptions. Well, I guess that fo follows, doesn't it? Um, but I, I feel from the, the way I've seen the internet used and its transformative powers, that the less we prescribe, the better the experience for those involved and the more they can um, not only participate, but they can appropriate the technology for their own purposes, whatever they may be. Thanks. Thank you. Who on the panel would, Jeremy? Um, yeah, I agree with you. That's a, a very good um, and incisive observation. I think one of the telling things is that these core principles uh, began as network engineering principles and then now are being applied as social ordering principles. Um, and uh, so there's no necessary um, validity to that. Um, but I think they are still useful in a certain context. We just shouldn't apply them outside their field uh, necessarily without at least examining that a lot more closely. Um, openness as well is something that means so many things to different people. Um, uh, it's almost like multi-stakeholderism has so many different meanings to different people. Like we have to, we have to drill down and say exactly what we mean and what what it means in a particular context, rather than just trying to say it's a general overarching principle. Okay. No, I just want to react to the last piece of your comment in terms of prescribe, right? You, you use the word prescribe. So in 99, like I worked seven years for Terra, which is the ISP provider of Telefonica, and then I went to academia and advocacy. But in 99, I wrote in a paper, uh, Oh, sorry. In INI, I wrote in a paper in Brazil that we didn't need regulation because we had enough laws with our civil code and our consumer code to deal with the problems. However, in 2003, 2004, when you saw the telcos uh, really going down the regulation path to break net neutrality, then my discourse and many others have changed because in 99, we had a uh, regulation coming out from an e-commerce perspective, right? So we didn't wonder that by then. But it's different, right? When the political forces, as you say, well, the telcos and some other uh, uh, major stakeholders, which are important in the game, of course, but they come and they try to regulate in one stakeholder favor without talking to others, and in general, the regulators are not so open for all the stakeholders, we need to contra-attack, contra right? to provide some balance. So I ag the diversity point, I agree, so that's not what I'm comment. But the rest, I'm a little more careful, exactly because of the politics and how they evolve over time in terms of who has the word and, and when. Sure. Um, I want to appreciate, again, the, um, the use of the, the, the um, principle that the, of prescribing as, as little as possible. I, I, I like that formulation. Um, and I think in, in, in answer to what Jeremy was saying, that's again, um, I appreciate the illustration of, of what, I, uh, what, uh, and what I think I was trying to say before about the different meanings of the word core. I don't think we're applying network engineering principles as social principles. I think we're applying, I think we're talking about network engineering principles that enable whatever social principles we want. And being very clear about the separation between building an internet that is robust and will adapt to whatever social principles you want. Because in fact, you go back 25 years and certainly in my experience, we didn't think we were building a network, for instance, to support privacy as a core value 
because the way we think of privacy today hadn't really been thought through then. We have a very diff different, different definition and a different set of concerns around privacy now than we did then. What they were deliberately building was an infrastructure and a way of building networks that when people do come along with privacy as a concern or the surveillance issues or the principles in the human rights declarations, that it is possible to, to adapt the network to support those. And I think that's actually a very important distinction um, as far as how you engineer the network that enables all of the important social goods that is really, you know, that are really what we're here to deliver. And I think as a, sort of a plug for George's other workshop, I think instantiating that and being able to clarify that distinction and work with that distinction in purely policy realms is actually where the technical community is not only able, but I have to say, I think obligated to, to take a role, to show up and have a voice. Thank you. Um, and now we, f we come to the gentleman on the aisle. Thank you very much. I'm Mr. Jor from Denmark, the Danish Media Council, representing the Danish government. Um, well, um, what, what I was thinking about is when we put, when we move the marketplace to the internet, something is really going to happen when we're talking about coalition between market um, stakeholders and government. Because in Denmark, we've had this case about a book. It's a book about the hippie culture in Denmark in the 60s. And the front page of this book is a naked woman running on the beach. She's very beautiful. But the, 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 um, the right holder of the book wanted to put this on Amazon. And Amazon put on uh, apples, on you know, what you don't want to see on the internet. And was, uh, what I was thinking here is freedom of expression. If you put the market on internet and these companies selling our products on the internet, they can decide what should we, what kind of books do we have, what kind of front pages do we, do we want on our books. Uh, this was a very big case in Denmark and actually our Minister for Culture raised this uh, case in uh, the EU community and, and she had meetings with Amazon but she didn't succeed them, to, she didn't convince them to say this is a, also a meaning what it means when we talk about freedom of expression. You cannot just censor a book like this. So you can say, what is my question? My question is to the panel maybe, is it when we come to core values and building a new internet society and the market moves into the internet, do we really believe that these companies will um, go for freedom of expression and, and so on? Or do we need some kind of core values also re re in relations to law enforcement? Thank you. Who would like to take that from the panel? Anyone? Alex? <laughs> Wait. I would like to take that. Oh, well, that's a hard well, question. Like Actually, that. I have a comment. Are the hunger on the comments? Oh, that, yes. Let, let him go. Yes. Alejandro, you go first. Uh, thank you. The, the principles that... Uh, thank you. I, I, I would like to... I'll be very brief. Uh, the, the principles that... Uh, the engineering principles, the engineering design principles that we're looking at uh, include the ones already discussed and a couple others. One of them is uh, layers architecture of the internet. Uh, one of the things that the operators and the, the standardizers of the internet teach us very much is to be careful about layer crossings or violations of the layer principle. That means adjusting one layer to favor one specific behavior in another layer instead of optimizing it in this one. A technical example would be to uh, adjust uh, the lower layers where you just have packet traveling so that the network looks more like a telephone network and thus gets optimized for both. What you know is that uh, you will gain for voice, but you will lose for messaging, for email, or for moving pictures, or for data access somewhere you will destroy.
destroy the balance. We take this one step further, and uh, we can say again, you know, when you're talking about human rights, and you're talking about things that are very important for many of us, like freedom of expression or freedom of association, the first thing you need is that you keep the internet full, uh, that you don't, for example, try to censor a book from Denmark in a country that doesn't like the book from Denmark, that you don't do that censoring by blocking access to Denmark in the network, because you have affected the openness principle. And here, openness is better defined because it's only openness in the technical sense. A network open to connect anything that complies with standards. And uh, a standardization process that is open. But you're not speaking about openness uh, with respect, for example, to languages, except if you look at the codes to express those languages, and so forth. So avoiding layer, the, the idea of, print, uh, of layers, and the idea of avoiding layer crossings helps you very much. It takes you, for example, to the law in Brazil, or to the troubles that Carolina has discussed. You don't try to solve legal or human conduct problems by juggling with the technical means. You solve them with the law. You solve them with human-to-human uh, -human social government. If someone is not allowing you uh, freedom of expression, you don't tweak the net. You use it as it is, uh, and you avoid also uh, doing things like the kill switch, which actually abuse the technical uh, architecture uh, to apply the law. And, uh, and, and th th this is the kind of useful contribution we try to make from this dynamic coalition. So it's to make sure that the network leaves freedom for everything else people want to do and to define it in the proper layer, which would be a legal or human right or a commercial one. Okay, if I could supplement, I fully agree with the gentleman that law enforcement should have value and principles. Uh, if they're enforcing laws, and there should be legal principles in that law. Uh, well, what I want to supplement is about this layer <laughs> Alejandro just mentioned, and, and w what is the interaction between technical values and the social values uh, we've been talking about. Um, uh, it, it seems these uh, set of values uh, 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 interplaying uh, closely. This is not a one way of communication. Uh, they, they're talking to each other, they're, they're influencing each other. The technical value could be adjusted in order to promote certain social value. And social value uh, can reflect this technical value. I have an example. I can introduce the internationalized domain name uh, program uh, to fulfill is 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 value of diversity. The diversity, of course, is a human right value and it's written into these human rights legal documents. And I, I do agree with a gentleman from Pacific Island, we, we should respect the language and cultural diversity from different groups, including the regional groups. Uh, to, um, uh, to achieve that diversity value at social level, uh, we need some uh, technical setting and arrangement. And what we can see is that at a technical level, we have to ensure that this internet is interoperable, it's interconnected. Uh, so we need to define what is a uniform standard to make sure what is a permissible code point uh, in this internationalized uh, native scripts domain names. Uh, and in some uh, I IDN communities, even more co complicated, uh, they have uh, uh, IDN variance characters, which is different characters. Well, for for non-speakers, they are different. They're not the same, but for the people using this language, they believe these two uh, lookingly uh, different characters are actually the same things. They, they need to be mapped up, link up. For that case, uh, the, well, I can at the top level to ensure the technical value, they need uh, uh, the coordination. That's really ICANN's technological coordination role. But on the other hand, it is the language community. They defined what is the variance recognized in that community. So it's actually they're working together to achieve these two values at a different level, but it's actually working for the same goal as uh, human beings, a common good. Right? Yeah, 
I'd like to reinforce Alex's point with regard to uh, the, uh, the primary role of the legal system here, and uh, I'd like to tell you an anecdote. About 15 years ago, I went to a museum presentation for that in which Adam Clayton Powell uh, had five television sets in the front of the room, and he had on each one there was the identical suggestive, sexually suggestive image uh, chosen to be borderline, and he said, which of these are legal? And it turned out that it had nothing to do with the borderline issue. It had to do with the method of delivery. Whether it was over the air, we were still uh, sending television signals over the air at that time. Whether it was cable, whether it was um, a videotape, whether it was a private thing, or and I can't remember the fifth. But the point is the same image uh, was uh, legal or illegal depending upon delivery. And it's unfortunate that delivery content isn't technologically neutral and it's unlikely to be even in a given co a single country, much less across country boundaries. So, Ong. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, Ping Hua, I'm from Singapore. Um, I have got three points to make. Um, I think one is that uh, there's a comment about values, I mean, being non prescriptive. But actually, I think what we are doing is we, have, we are assuming values already in the way we act, in the way we interact. Saying to be the values should be non-prescriptive is a value in itself. So I think that we should, we should spell it out as opposed to leaving it there unspoken. My second point is I think writing it out or spelling it out is a good thing because then it forces us to look at issues, to reconcile things. And it also then answers uh, governments who may say, well, who says that? So I think when you have something written out, that is uh, that's a positive thing. It also forces us to look at situations where there are conflicts in principles and actions. So when it's conflict, how are we going to resolve conflicts? We come back to values and principles. So I think these are quite um, important things. The third point is that I agree with Alejandro that we shouldn't see values as arising out of engineering. The engineering approach assumes trade-offs in everything you do. You want a cheap laptop or a good laptop? A cheap laptop or a light laptop? A cheap laptop or a powerful laptop? There are trade-offs in everything that you do, and engineers tend to approach it from the point of view of trade-offs. In some of the various principles, there are no trade-offs. There is no trade-off in human rights. You can't trade off a human right. It's by definition, you cannot. It's inalienable. So I think that the engineering uh, approach uh, to trying to solve some of these issues is not, uh, is not ultimately not helpful. It may appear to be helpful in the short run in certain situations, but I don't think it's ultimately helpful. And I think we need to fall back on looking at, um, at values through such, such forums. So I applaud such, um, such forum. I hope it continues uh, next year if, and, and on. Thank you. Comments from the panel? Anyone? Alice? Suzanne? Alex? Would you care to comment on that? No. Okay. So, I, I think the the statement uh, seems to yes. be accepted and yes. <laughs> doesn't uh, doesn't seem to cause. Oh, some, very Sebastian. Here, maybe, oh. Very here and oh. Thank you, Alex. We can't hear you. Hmm. Alex, are you there? Okay, I guess uh, not. Yes, I am here. Oh, okay, talk uh, very I'm talk loudly, here. please. Here, I'm Peng Hua with uh, this thing about the engineering compromises. That is exactly the point of the coalition. Yes, that is exactly the point of the coalition. In, in, in engineering, you can be guided by certain principles, get some compromises, and for example, our predecessors did a fabulous job by giving us a, an interval that uh, works so well in, in the sense of openness, facilitation, permissionless innovation. When you go to the upper layer, the discussion where people say, I cannot yield in this human right, you find that human rights indeed are not uh, susceptible to concessions, but people have different sets or different interpretations without concessions. But you have to make sure at the lower layer is that we keep the network running in such a way and growing in such a way that whatever the result of those discussions, there will still be a network on which to implement it. And that's a beautiful complementarity we see between working on the core principles of this lower layer and uh, in dialogue with uh, everyone else who's working at the higher layers. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, other comments? Uh, Sebastian, do we have anybody remote with a, with a question or a comment? Uh, 
okay. Uh, we have a question from one of the remote participants from Jolie. Uh, she's from New York City. She, oh, he's from New York City. And uh, the question is, how does the increasing reliance of on content delivery networks and cloud affects the end to the end principle? Sorry, uh, I repeat again. How does the increasing reliance on content delivery networks and cloud affect the end to end principle? Thank you. Anybody want to take that? I'm not sure. We, you know, I'm not sure we have an answer for that. Uh, uh, Suzanne, I think. Yeah, let me let me see if I can. I'm glad somebody asked about the end-to-end -end principle, which, in engineering terms, is the idea that you can ignore how information gets to you and is in fact exactly the opposite of George's example a few minutes ago. The idea being that, that what you get is independent of how it got to you. Um, and in fact, the cloud, the cloud technologies, NAT, um, there are a great many technologies that in fact compromise the end-to-end -end principle, lead to less transparency um, for, the, for the user and even for the operator about who has control of what pieces of information, you know, when and how. But if you look at Alex's scorecard, um, there are also technological advances that have, have, have sort of, that are addressing that head on. For example, DNSSEC, which is a specific technology for signing DNS data so that you can validate that no matter how it got to you, whether from a cloud service or through a NAT, or however it, get, it, however it reaches the user who made the query, you can tell, you, you can validate that the data that gets to you is what was originally put in the DNS, what was intended for you to get, that your ISP hasn't tampered with it, your content provider hasn't changed the answer f for their own reasons. And we are making progress slower than, than perhaps sometimes it seems we should be on almost reinventing end-to-end -end in a network that doesn't use the same technology and doesn't use the same orientation it did where the principle was formed, and frankly, we miss it, and we're, we're reinventing it in some ways. I can see two uh, issues here. Uh, one is just, just observing that, uh, well, my homepage is the New York Times, and uh, when I get it in uh, Bali here, uh, it, it's full of Indonesian ads. Uh, and I know that the New York Times doesn't publish in Indonesian. And of course, this is, it's very common now to have, uh, to have space uh, rented out on web pages and have local advertisers fill in. So that is a clear violation of the end-to-end -end principle. It doesn't destroy information, but it adds it. And it may add it in such a way as to, uh, uh, to change the, uh, the impression of the contents. The, the other issue, of course, is the legal issue, that when you transmit information and there is an intermediate um, host, and there always will be intermediate hosts, at least a couple, and there may be a lot more if you go through the cloud. Uh, who owns that information? Who has the right to look at that information, et cetera? Those are questions which have very different answers depending upon who is answering them and where they are sitting. And that, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't comment more, but I think that's going to be one of the major qu uh, issues to be addressed in cloud computing, as well as even non-cloud computing. Any comments to, further comments on the issue? Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes left. Uh, oh, okay. uh, from the lawyer perspective, it's very interesting what you said, actually, because it also, who owns the information, or, or if anybody should own the information or control that information. And, and at the end, whatever your information passes, all the, the actors, they say, wait, I do own here, so I have the right to know where you are, what you're doing, who you are, so here's your ad. Right, which also conflicts with the privacy right, which is a human right. So I think it's a really, it's a really good good question uh, because, for example, when we are discussing information flow, too, which means that these actors they want information flow, right? But nobody wants exceptions for privacy. That's one of our fights in trade agreements right now. So I think you are right. This is one of the biggest issues for me right now. 
Uh, yeah, I agree with Carolina. That's a very um, obvious example of a clash um, when it comes to privacy versus um, end to end. And another example of that that's very closely related is um, IPv6 migration, uh, which is designed to restore some of the end to end principles so that we all have our own IP addresses again. But then privacy advocates are worried about the extent to which that will make tracking easier. So, um, yeah, that's a good example indeed. Sure. Hi, Dan McGarry again uh, from the Pacific Institute of Public Policy. Um, I, I think this is actually a really good example of uh, why I feel that the battles are actually going to be fought out in the regulatory world rather than the legislative world. Um, and uh, I think that we, we should really keep this in the front of our minds as we develop language around this because regulatory language looks a lot different from legislative language and in fact it serves very different purposes. But maintaining that neutral platform um, that allows us to quite clearly and unambiguously but with great diversity express the social mores and the social values that you know particular populations uh, may hold, um, that, that's to me, or at least everything I've seen as we roll out internet across the Pacific, that's where I see the fight happening. And in fact, I spend more time sort of sitting with the regulators than I do with the legislators uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff. Thank you. Olivier? Thank you, Olivier crepin Um Someone just mentioned IPv6 and, and it's uh, introducing a whole lot of problems with regards to privacy and so on. Of course, the alternative is carrier grade network address translation, which would as well break the internet core principle of end-to-end -end, uh, end -end connection and end-to-end uh, -end user um, connection. So that's, th there's no easy answer to the future, unfortunately. Um, but it's good that we keep a close eye on all of those potential problems and uh, try and find uh, perhaps long-term uh, solutions if we can. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. I'd like to end the session by asking Alejandro uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Alejandro, I note that you are in effect setting up a, uh, a core Internet Values Observatory. Uh, in which you're tracking the uh, uh, the state of these uh, of these principles over time, uh, but um, first you have three end -end, uh, three principles which you're tracking. Why should it be three? Are there more? Are there less? Do you see this evolving, uh, or are these cast in concrete uh, and uh, fallen uh, uh, from the uh, from the original uh, implementers of the internet? Uh, and second. Uh, what would you recommend to people here who want to participate in the dynamic coalition or to help you in your work or both? That may be the same thing. Do we have Alejandro online? Yes, George, I'm online. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, very, uh, speak much louder, please. Thank you for this uh, question. Thank you for these uh, two very important questions. I think they honor the audience's participation today, which has been uh, extraordinary. I, I value this discussion very much. Uh, first, no, there are a few more principles. I already mentioned the layer principle. Uh, Suzanne has mentioned scalability. Uh, we have a, a bit more information on the coalition website and uh, we'll be putting forward uh, immediately a, a document uh, that, uh, that allows to identify these things. We are getting this from a retrospective analysis. We had in the previous year's meetings of the coalition, we had people like Scott Bradner, Vinton Cerf, uh, the, the people who were there really at the beginning explaining us how these values came to be and how, how they are important. Now, uh, to, to move forward, I think that uh, we will set up this observatory and make it known very fast, uh, at least in a very skeletal process, and we will call for people's help to flesh out the table and the evaluation that we have, let's say, for closing on the period of 2012-2013, uh, and to create a more dynamic structure for reporting 
on things that impinge significantly on these values during the year from now to the next IGF where I hope that we can have a, uh, a next step of this discussion looking for you know, the important coalition, the engineering compromises that are being made, uh, the things that uh, seem good but could actually do some damage to here, and also for a, I think a very important thing, uh, going back for example to Dan McGarry and others uh, like Alice Muno in regions where access is still very difficult, uh, to provide you with tools for thought and analysis where you can, for example, let me just take one example from Carolina, you are looking, and, and from George, you are looking at owners of information, owners of services that take that information from end to end. You have to make sure, for example, that the transit contracts, the transport contracts, and so forth, are embodying the end-to-end -end principle as much as possible in order to make sure that it is against the contract and against the law to tamper or interfere with the information that starts at the origin and has to reach the end. I think we will be able to provide people over the year with opportunities to build this collectively and provide these valuable tools for people who are making decisions from the individual consumer all the way up to the highest level of policy making, that they are wise decisions that enrich the internet instead of contending against it. I want to thank uh, George for the very valuable contributions he made and for picking this up. I'm thanking him also in the name of uh, Shiva, uh, Subramanian Mutusami, who hasn't been able to participate remotely. And uh, I will make a special mention for the interpreters and, transcri and scribes because they have made possible my participation and remote participation for those of us who were left with audio. The way we've been doing this is reading the transcript as it goes and participating in response, and they have done a wonderful job. Thanks, everybody, for taking part in this session. Thank you, Alex. Well, we're done with the session. We're certainly done with the principals and, the, and their discussion. Uh, and uh, Alex has uh, uh, suggested that if you want to help, uh, there's a way to help. Uh, and if you want to discuss the issues with the people who are here at the IGF, we're all here, and this has been a very energized session. I think that with good audience participation, uh, this discussion is not going to end here. So please join me in uh, thanking both the panelists and the audience for an interesting hour and a half before we go to lunch.